Well, this is kind of sad. It's the last crossover we have. It's week 18 of the 2021 NFL season. Alex Nancy Bo Brock, uh, parting is such sweet sorrow. I don't know. Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks, one of our favorites, joining us for another crossover Thursday. Thank you for making Locked On Cardinals and Locked On Seahawks, respectively, your first listen. Free and available on all platforms. No paywall here on the Locked On Podcast Network. So this matchup here on Sunday it's got a bunch of different storylines, more surface level for the Cardinals and a little bit deeper for the Seahawks as they look to finish out the 2021 season in a positive way and kind of look into the offseason, see what needs to be tweaked, if anything, or if it's a running back scenario, Pete, Pete Carroll, John Schneider, et cetera. We're going to get deep into both sides of this matchup. Corbin, in the kind of how do we how did we get here part of the crossover that we do, You've had kind of a tumultuous path covering this team this year where Russell Wilson, who never misses games, got Brett Favre and ends up being out for, for a handful of games. Geno Smith p- played competent football. Chris Carson's been out since you know pretty much the beginning of the season. The injuries have kind of been the storyline for the crux of the season where it was winning time to stay in contention. Can you see this season with any wins in it? Like, are there any successes in this season, whether it be young guys, veterans, or whatever? Or is this kind of like a tough season to get through and look on to 2022? Uh, I think it's it's a very difficult season to look back on and really find many positives just because this is a team that won 12 games a year ago. They had most of their roster intact returning, and I never thought I would see a season where Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson were together where – they finished with six, seven wins or less. Now, obviously, that's pertaining to Wilson's durability. He had never missed a game before the season. That was a big part of it. So I think you can look at that as a silver lining. And finally, getting Russell Wilson to admit that he was not close to 100% when he came back from surgery, too. He did not look good at all the first three or four games after he came back. He started to play a bit more like the Russell Wilson that we're accustomed to seeing in the past couple of games. Uh, but he just wasn't himself when he returned. And so, yeah, they thought they were going to be right back in the playoff race. Once he came back from injury, he was going to save the day with his Superman cape on, and that didn't happen. But there are a few bright spots here at the end of the season, most notably Rashad Penny finally playing like the first-round talent that the Seahawks thought they were bringing in a few years back. And this is a kid that I loved at San Diego State. I got to scout him in person for two games. I watched him run all over a really good Arizona State defense. So when Seattle picked him in the first round, I was one of the few people that was like, I really like this pick. And most people were like, it's a running back. You can't pick them in the first round. And then he's had countless injuries. His first three and a half years had less than a thousand rushing yards. And then suddenly the last five weeks, he has just been a monster. 235 pounds, great burst. He's rushed for over 500 yards in that span, had 170 last weekend, has scored a bunch of touchdowns, just got Offensive Player of the Week in the NFC. He's going to be a free agent after the season. He's had so many injuries, so I'm really curious what his market looks like. But the defense is in the top six in scoring defense. They've got a running game that's found its groove. As of late, Russell Wilson's playing a little bit better, more like we're accustomed to. So I guess those are the bright spots now is that the team has been playing a little bit better. Even that loss to the Bears, there were some positives in that game, but inexplicable errors late, that has been the tail of the season. They just haven't had the bounces go their way at the end of games, and that's why they've lost five games by three points or less. That's how thin the margin of error has been for the Seahawks team this year. They've usually been on the right side of the bubble. Not the case this year. Whereas Arizona, a lot of their games early on, especially – they've been able to get a lot of those bounces, maybe not as much in the second half, but there's a reason that they're 11 and five and the Seahawks are in the position that they're in. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, they were able to capitalize, take advantage of a lot of those mistakes made by other teams. The Arizona Cardinals were able to, you know, anytime they put the ball on the turf, they were able to fall on those. We've seen the high, you know, fumble recovery numbers that we're not going to kind of say that the Cardinals haven't had a little bit of luck on your side. When you have successful seasons, I mean, a lot of times that oblong football has to go your direction, and it certainly has this season for the Arizona Cardinals, but there is a, a ton of talent as well. But we, we saw during that three-game stretch, Cor- Corbin, when the when the Cardinals were kind of struggling, uh, they fell to the Rams and they fell to the Colts and they fell to the Lions, a team that the Seahawks just, just extinguished, just made easy work of with 51 points. Um, 
what you're telling me with Pete Carroll, where his mindset is, where Rashad Penny, a guy whose fifth year option was declined, is ready for unrestricted free agency. He's rolling, and Russell Wilson is leaps and bounds from where he was the first game coming back against the Arizona Cardinals from the finger in- injury. Is if the Arizona Cardinals don't come into this game prepared, they could get smacked. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, it, quickly uh, before you expound upon that, Corbin, like, this is a total flip of what the Cardinals are used to, where during the Bruce Arians era, the Cardinals would always go into Seattle in week 17 and mess up their party. You know, they won a couple games. I think it was two out of three years when B.A. was head coach. They won in Seattle when Seattle was the world beaters, where there was some variation of the Legion of Boom and Marshawn Lynch and Russell Wilson, et cetera. Like, this is a total script flipped. And the Seahawks, because if the Rams lose and the Cardinals win, the Rams uh, win the division. The Rams could definitely lose to the 49ers, but as Bo said, and we'll talk about betonline.ag and their line in a second, it was at six and a half. Are people not watching the Seahawks? Like, they're fully healthy now. And that, well, and you know, as close as you can be in, in, in week 18 with all of your running backs hurt like they always are, but like six and a half points, and we'll get to in a second. Like, do you see that as kind of a slight on, on the Seahawks' offense, especially right now? Uh, not really, just because most of the year they've been in the 20s for offense, but they are playing a lot better in recent weeks. Some of it has been the competition, but again, the Cardinals got spanked by the Lions a few weeks ago, and the Seahawks went out and did the same thing to the Lions, putting up a 50-burger, and they could have scored 70 in that game. They had some opportunities inside the 10 late that they didn't score, and they purposely took a knee at the one-yard line to close out the game. I mean, it was a mercy rule knee by Pete Carroll and company. So they could have put up 70 in that football game against the fighting Matt Campbells or fighting Dan Campbells. I always mix those two up because the Lions were trying to hire Matt Campbell at one point. So they just like their Campbells in Detroit, apparently. But uh, the Seahawks offense finally getting some things going with their ground game only helps Russell Wilson with his skill set. He's throwing the football better. So, you know, I understand the line based on how Seattle's played most of the season. But if you're going off of recency bias, then I think that that line probably should be a lot closer than that because of the way the Seahawks were humming last week and the way the running game is going now with Russell Wilson. Alex Lancy, Bo Brock, locked on Cardinals. Corbin Smith, locked on Seahawks, one of our favorites. Uh, Coming up next, Corbin is going to ask us any and all things he has on his mind regarding the Cardinals as they head into potentially an NFC West clinching win, obviously depending on what the Rams do. Uh, He's going to get into that after this. First, betonline.ag, one of our favorites here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Betonline.ag with their new updated and streamlined interface and just it, it they're it's so easy to maneuver around go to betonline.ag they remain the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022 it's a new year and a new updated desktop as i mentioned and mobile website use that to sign up today receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit using promo code locked on to get started from football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available in 2022. Again, go to the website or use your mobile device today to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit using promo code Locked On. You can use that extra cheese to take what side you like of the six and a half points that the Cardinals are laying at home against the Seahawks come Sunday. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Crossover Thursday, the last one that we get to enjoy together in the regular season. The Cardinals will get some crossover specials, at least one in the playoffs. The Seahawks will not. And you guys mentioned it. Bo Brock, Alex Clancy, Locked on Cardinals. I'm Gord Smith at Locked on Seahawks. Normally, the script has been a lot different when these teams get together late in the season. Usually, the Seahawks are the team that's talking about playoffs and competing for division championships, but that has changed this year with the Seahawks being in last place, double digit losses for the first time since 2009. The Cardinals still have a chance to win the NFC West going into this season finale at their home field. So I'm going to kick it over to Bo here first, because this is a team that just got off to such a red hot start. And Kyler Murray comes back from his ankle injury, had a good game against the Cowboys a week ago. But his numbers the last five or six games have been pretty underwhelming by his standards, particularly as a passer. What have you seen from Kyler and this offense in general in the second half where they've had their struggles winning games? 
Yeah, inconsistency. And it's been inconsistency as far as which playmakers are available and which offensive linemen are available. And, you know, we've seen when Kyler Murray's in the lineup and when Rodney Hudson, the former All-Pro center, comes over from Las Vegas uh, and they're on the field together, this unit is 8-1. and one. And when he's not on the field, this is an offense that struggles. And, you know, Cliff Kingsbury said as far as non-quarterback MVP goes, that's Rodney Hudson. That's the backbone of this offense. And, you know, when, when they can get that consistent play from the center position and they can get consistent, you know, uh, you know, protection in the middle of that offensive line, they're very good and tough to beat offense. I mean, I think Kyler Murray, uh, he, he had to kind of knock some rust off from missing three games, four weeks total, what was it, 38 total days between seeing the playing field and then getting back out there. So there was rust to be knocked off, but I think Kyler Murray, he needed a little bit of a fire also lit underneath his his tush uh, to to get going again as well, because he he's somebody that some you know he's he's been the best player on the field at every level he's played at, and sometimes it, it it's he forgets that this is a hard game and what he needs to do he needs to do the proper things as far as preparation and his focus. Uh, it, it's it's not stat Corbin. Nine of his ten interceptions have come in the third quarter. Like that, that's a very weird quarter to have all your picks come. I, and I think it's a lack of focus sometimes for Kyler, Kyler Murray. It's like one pick in the first half is this season and one in the fourth quarter when it means the most. What's going on in the third quarter? I think that it might just be something where he lacks focus. And when he is dialed in, he can play at that MVP caliber level. But when he's not, he can become very pedestrian. And I think, uh, you know, a guy like Rodney Hudson kind of really, really makes things go for the Arizona Cardinals offense, which is weird because. You know, the center, you just think about a guy snapping the football, but protection and kind of keeping him focused on where things are going to come from the opposing defense. That's what Rodney Hudson does for Kyler Murray in this whole Cardinals offense. Let's flip to the defense now because the defense has had some injuries for the Cardinals as well. J.J. Watt, who knows if he's going to be back. Sounds like that's a possibility, but no idea if that's guaranteed for the playoffs. They've had a few other guys get banged up back there. And I was looking statistically, Alex, they've still been really good at limiting the big plays, which is always big against the Seahawks with their receivers, their ability to get the ball downfield. They're third fewest in the league for 20 plus yard pass plays, but they also are near the bottom of the league in touchdowns allowed in the passing game, which I don't believe that was the case when these two teams met the first time middle of the season. So what, what has changed for the defense? They're still fifth in points against, but they have had a few games where the defense has not been playing at the same level they were the first half of the season. I mean, I feel like Bo would agree with me here in that the defense started out kicking its coverage immediately. Like we thought that we didn't know what this defense was going to look like. You know, Malcolm Butler retiring. Can can uh, Byron Murphy be an outside corner, let alone a CB1? Marco Wilson, a fourth-round pick. Can he be a CB2 and uh, can Robert Alford stay on the field? What are the two inside def- inside linebackers going to look like with Zayvon Collins and Isaiah Simmons? And can Jordan Hicks play football? Is Chandler Jones washed up? Can Jordan Phillips stay healthy? Is J.J. Watt going to be able to stay on the field? And the only, the only non-questioned position group on defense to start the season was a safety group with Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson. You know both of them very well, Wazoo and Washington respectively. And what we've seen is they've become the anchor for this defense in their own way, where both of them are towards the line of scrimmage a lot more than traditional safety duo. And we've seen Jordan Hicks really initiate the I'm the leader of this linebacking core from the middle of the field. And the pass rush has used, was a lot better. Marcus Golden, Chandler Jones have put up good numbers. They put good pressure on the on the, uh, on the the quarterback. But it's still every week kind of like, a, can they do it again? Can they do it again? And, you know, we saw against Detroit and, and the Rams in, in back-to-back weeks, like, they're still human beings. If the offense can't stay on the field, they're going to get tired and they're going to look worse. So I think a lot of what you're saying touchdown-wise, it has to do with that. But the fact that they don't give up a lot of big plays, the fact that they're average to above average in open field tackling, which is a very you know under-excitable thing to talk about, but it's important. Like That's been keeping the glue together. And Vance Joseph has seemingly been a wizard in elevating the talent around him. He hasn't been perfect all year, but they've played at an elevated level for the talent on paper that they have. 
Yeah, in, in, my, in my opinion, at least. <laughs> What's interesting about that defense is that I remember when we were together for our first crossover, one of the things that immediately jumped me on film was that I, I saw a defense that really was struggling to defend the run. But then I watched the game against the Cowboys, who have two really good running backs, and the Cardinals just went into shutdown mode against yeah. the run. So that really offers a lot of intrigue going into this game because, like I said earlier in the show, the Seahawks now, they're running the football the way that Pete Carroll wants to run the football with Rashad Penny. They might be getting – uh, they won't be getting Alex Collins back. He's going on injured reserve. But they have DJ Dallas has played well. But Penny's been the real deal there. The offensive line's playing a lot better. So they're going to want to run the ball. And yet the Cardinals, they've taken a 180 for a good reason defending the run going in this game. So now it's kind of going to be, okay, uh, one which side here is going to be able to win this out when the run defense has been good and the run game has been good for the two teams? Who's going to ultimately win that? Yeah, you know, it is part of the scheme, and it worked to perfection against the Cowboys and what they really have done all season long, and sometimes it works and sometimes it hasn't, is they make first down, sometimes second down, and pressure down. And they'll bring a lot of their, their edge rushers and maybe blitz, have some exotic blitzes and get some corners in there, some safeties in there, some linebackers in there to try to make big negative plays against an offense and put them in second and long, third and long. And that's what worked to perfection against Dallas. And that's what was, you know, kind of the end of Dak Prescott, why he's been slumping the last couple of games is because he struggled in third and long. And Vance Joseph's defense was able to execute that a lot against Dallas. And they've been able to execute that here and there throughout the season. Now, when an offense can get going and consistently gash the Arizona Cardinals on defense on early downs, and put themselves in second and third manageable, they've had a lot of success against them. So, And that's just against any NFL team. But the Arizona Cardinals, that's the scheme. They want to create pressure. They want to create negative plays early on. So first down's a pressure down. If they can get you know, uh, Rashad Penny, I almost said his brother Elijah Penny, former Arizona Cardinal. At least he didn't uh, say can, Rashad Penny like Dick Stockton <laughs> says every time. <laughs> if they can get Penny on the turf and, and keep limit him early, maybe create some negative plays, and put Russ in third and long, you know, I know he's got those talented receivers. I know DK Metcalf just had a three touchdown performance, but that's going to be ideal for this defense in this contest. That's their, that's their scheme. I know we're going to be moving. Uh, we're going to be shifting gears here and I can only imagine which player or players that you guys are going to be asking about when it comes to beyond this week, because the Seahawks aren't going to be playing in the playoffs. There's been a lot of speculation. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, but beforehand here, Seahawks and Cardinals fans, there's an incredible app everyone who buys gas needs to know about. Get Upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price of the pump anymore. Get cash back. Using Get Upside, download the app for free and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to three hundred dollars a month in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account, so you can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or even an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free Get Upside app and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get up to 50 cents. Per gallon cash back on your first tank. That's the code touchdown on the GetUpside app. All right, final segment, crossover Thursday, locked on Cardinals, locked on Seahawks. Uh, Corbin Smith, I'll be gentle. I'll wait till the end to ask the questions that we need to ask. Let's focus on the game on Sunday, on the game at hand. Uh, regardless, thank you to everybody who makes Locked on Cardinals and Locked on Seahawks your first listen every day, free and available on all platforms. Truly appreciate it. We wouldn't be able to do any of this without you. Um, we're constantly blown away by, you know, the interaction we have on Twitter during game days or for Bo and myself, our halftime shows. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm enamored with the Seattle Seahawks. I always have been. I think the offense, when Russell Wilson throws the ball 13 times in a game and they win, he, he has like Bo and I joke, like Russell Wilson only needs one good drive to win games sometimes. And it's this weird dynamic where the defense doesn't always have to be good. And the run game doesn't, doesn't always have to be great, but 
one drive like with two minutes left in the third quarter, you go down to score a touchdown, 70 yard drive in two minutes, and the game completely flips on its head. Feels like seems like Russell Wilson is the master of that, all the while without having a good offensive line pretty much for the entire time he's there. How much juice is Russell Wilson still a one A quarterback in this league? I don't know if I would say that he's one A. If, if we're talking about you know top three, top five, I think that he's maybe in that gray area between that group and the next group down at this point. Because I think that you're seeing a QB that's still very good at throwing the football downfield. I still think you can make an argument he's got the best deep ball in the NFL. He's still that rainbow that he can drop into the bucket 50, 60 yards downfield is so beautiful. What he's had issues with this year – especially after having the finger injury. So it's excusable to an extent. He wasn't healthy when he came back. The accuracy on third down throws in short to intermediate game. He's just been really air mailing throws way more than you're used to seeing. And it feels like the last couple of weeks that has gotten better because he's healthier. And he's admitted that to us at least now that he was not close to 100% when he came back. But that is really what has killed this offense. Their third down ineptitude. And then the defense is on the field for a bazillion plays. There's a reason Bobby Wagner and Jordan Brooks have like 4,000 tackles apiece. It's because the Seahawks are constantly on the field on defense, but their offense has shown some signs of being able to get stay on the field, convert on those third down opportunities as of late. So going back to Russell Wilson, the, the diminishing athleticism is something to watch. I don't know how his game is going to age because of that. We might be seeing some true signs of decline for that reason but he still can create outside of the pocket. He can still scramble when he needs to, not like he used to be able to, but I think when he is at his best, you can still make an argument top five quarterback. I just don't know that he's consistently going to be quite at that level from here on out, but it might've just been the injury this year. We'll have to wait and see. We we talked about him already a little bit, Rashad Penny. Uh, you know he's got over 300 yards in his last two games, three touchdowns. You know, he, he seems to be following the the Son Reddick path to success, where he just, just doesn't do anything for the first three seasons of his career. They decline his fifth option, and then when he's about to get paid, he pops. What's been the difference between Penny? You know the first couple seasons, and then the last couple weeks, and in the Arizona Cardinals, what's what's the blueprint to slowing down the running back? So it's a little different situation than Hassan Reddick, where he was getting a ton of snaps most of the time. It just wasn't doing anything. Rashad Penny has been good when he has played. That has been the problem. He's missed almost 30 games in his career. He's just, and it's crazy because he had no durability concerns coming out of San Diego State. This dude was a rock at college. The guy that you could feed the ball 30 times a game and wasn't going to get banged up. He was just going to keep rolling and He's got such a unique skill set. I mean, he's 235, 240 pounds, and he's got that third and fourth gear that's just so effortless when he gets to the second level. And if you don't take the perfect angle, he's going to break through arm tackles because of his size. And he's been doing that. I mean, he forced nine missed tackles last week alone. The blocking's been really good in front of him to go with it. So that's why he's been exploding for 130 plus yards pretty much every game for the last month. He's actually been able to stay on the field. So now you're seeing the physical tools that have always been there. He just hasn't been able to get in a rhythm. And I think his confidence really took a hit after he tore his ACL because he was really starting to figure things out two years ago. And then non-contact injury against the Rams. He's out for the rest of the season. He missed almost all of last year. And I just don't think that his confidence was there running the football You've seen that change, though, now that he's been able to stay on the field for several games in a row, and he is now the featured back. No Chris Carson. He's the guy. He's just been going out there and dominating, and I feel like they haven't gotten him involved in the passing game like they potentially could. This kid can do that as well. So I'm really happy for him. I just hope he can stay healthy. That has been the biggest problem is staying out of the top. Yeah, and and you're missing one big name. Derrick Henry didn't pop till his third year either. He was a rotational guy first two years, and then he absolutely smoked out. Um, okay, I want to get uncomfortable here just for a minute. Like, it, it's not it, it's not uncomfortable. You know, it's not so much about Russell Wilson and where he's going to go. Because sure, I'll I'll actually give you a pass if I if you think he's going to be traded or not. Because I think I it, people talk about that all the time, and I'm sure you talk about it a lot. Why has John Schneider not been given more excrement, as it were? for his inability to draft players like it, uh, overall 
because we we're it's very near and dear to us that it's been a very top heavy draft experience from Steve Kime, Buda Baker, Kyler Murray, you know DJ Humphreys, but like DK Metcalf, Russell Wilson. I mean Bobby Wagner is probably the but like there have been so many just empty top draft rounds with John Schneider drafting them. Is there like is there fire John? Has it been going on for a couple of years, or is that just an outsider looking in and being completely off base? I think that there should be some fire on him. I don't know about to the point where he should have his position terminated because you can counter the first round issues that they've had. And again, I just mentioned one of those players, Rashad Penny, if he's healthy, that's a good looking pick. And he's showing that the last five games. He's a first round caliber player. Well, he when, he led college football in rushing that year that he got drafted. So it wasn't like yeah. he wasn't, he was a no name. Yeah. But LJ Collier, on the other hand, LJ Collier was a very late bloomer at TCU, a guy that I had a third round grade on. I didn't dislike the player. It's just, it was a reach. I mean, it was a guy that they, all the defensive ends that were on the first round in that draft were gone. So I think John Schneider got into panic mode and picked a play and they could have got Montez sweat, but they traded back. So that was an instance where trying to accumulate draft picks ended up backfiring. And that's happened quite a bit for him. So I think that the criticism that has been placed on him is warranted, but then you can look at some of the moves that he's made with trades too. I mean, obviously the Jamal Adams deal has not worked out how the Seahawks wanted it to. But they got Quandre Diggs for a fifth-round pick, and Quandre Diggs has been a top-three free safety in the NFL the last two years. He's been fantastic. So you gave up peanuts for him. you got Carlos Dunlap, who has come on strong second half of the year, really struggled first half, but was great last year. You traded a seventh-round pick in B.J. Finney, an out-of-shape backup center, to get it. So it feels like John Schneider has still done some really nice things. There's been some good mid round picks. I think they're one of their last first rounders. Jordan Brooks is actually turning into a very good football player. So I I don't know that he deserves to be fired, but I certainly understand the criticism and the first round picks, the whiffs on guys like Jermaine Effetti and Malik McDowell. That was not his fault. I mean, Malik McDowell went and got an ATV act. Now he's playing for the Cleveland Browns. Like you can't write that story, but um, there's been some bad luck. There's been some, certainly some whiffs early in the, in the draft. There's been some trades that didn't work out, but he's also made a lot of really smart, savvy moves as well that have kept this team in the playoff hunt until this year. And, and I don't necessarily know that that's the biggest reason that they have fallen, fallen yeah. down to the bottom of the division. Really? I think there's been a lot of injuries that have played a role in that. And, and it feels like they just haven't had the, the fortune, the fortune just hasn't been there for them this year in those close games. So as as far as, you know, week 18 goes, the regular season finale, what is this, the end of, is it just the end of the season and they try to forget, you know, what, what just went on and, you know, no Russell Wilson for a couple games. They've lost double digits for the last time between Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson being on together. Like, what is this, the end of what, like, what, what can we expect to happen between now at the end of the 2021 campaign and the beginning of the 2022 season? You tell me, because that's that's really where we're at right now. L- listen, and I told you guys about this in the earlier shows. I thought last year a lot of the Russell Wilson drama was just smoke, and I still will stand by that. The people that I talked to said they are not trading Russell Wilson, and he's got a no-trade clause. So the Seahawks, if they don't want to make a move there, they're not going to be making a move and moving him. So, I mean, I think that there's a chance that it could happen this off season. This could be the end of number three, but I also feel like you've seen some things over the last couple of weeks that suggest that, you know, maybe Russell Wilson understanding, you know, my injury really set us back this year. You know, there's a lot of games we could have won if I didn't get hurt. This is not like last year where it's like my pass protection is just stunk and I'm frustrated by it. The pass pro has actually been pretty good the second half of the season for him. A lot of the issues have fallen on him not making the throws, and they've had some injuries. Their defense has had some injuries. Again, some misfortune. So I I don't know if this is an end of an era. I could see a situation where Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson are both gone. I could see Bobby Wagner being somewhere else next year. I could also easily see Jody Allen, the owner, be like, you know what? We didn't lose most of these games very many points. We had injuries. Russell Wilson played well at the end of the season. Let's just run it back, and let's just try to retool one more time. This feels like a team that if they address a few of the positional issues they've got, add a little more depth, 
they could bounce right back and be an 11, 12 win outfit next year with a healthy Russell Wilson. So I don't, I don't really have any idea what's going to happen. And it, it kind of makes it fun, but at the same time, it's kind of mind numbing because you're like, I had to deal with this last off season. And that's, that's where we're at right now. So it could be the end of the end of an era, or it could be, you know what, we're almost at a finish line, but let's give it one more go and see if we can keep this thing rolling. And I, I think it's anyone's guess at this point what the Seahawks are going to do. This this is the most unpredictable team heading into this offseason in the entire NFL, and I really don't think it's close. Yeah, it's a trip, man. I mean, because it's it was draft a third-round quarterback, build a defense, win a Super Bowl, and it was like, man, they're going to be able to do this forever. And like the Russell Wilson thing to me is, and, and we'll get out of here. We're, we're going long, but we love going long with Corbin. Um Corbin Smith locked on Seahawks. Alex Clancy Brobach locked on Cardinals crossover Thursday was like, he was the first one where it's like, man, they gave him a lot of money. And then they started not winning playoff games like they did before. Now, I don't know if it's a direct correlative. I don't know if it's confirmation bias on my side where it's like, once you pay a quarterback, you're not going to win Super Bowls anymore. Like Tom Brady's kind of ruined this thing where he was restructuring, but he was getting all the money guaranteed anyway, but it was able to do things like as, as a goodbye note here. If it were you, is Russell Wilson going to be the last person on this constructed roster? Like, are you going to save him in place of everybody else? Or if there is an offer a year from now, two years, when he's still under contract for two first-round picks at 34, 35, is that something that you'd revisit? Or do you think this team will always be better with Russell Wilson? Yes. Um, I, think, I think everybody's always got a price. And I think that's what I would say right now, especially with my earlier comments that I do think Russell Wilson now is entering the second phase of his career and not that he can't still be one of the best quarterbacks in the league. But I, I think that his days of his prime years, I think we're seeing him move away from that. That that's my belief. And so if you have a team come in, I'll just throw this one out here real quick. Let's say the Chicago Bears call back, call back and say, you know what? Justin Fields had a rough rookie year. Matt Nagy, that didn't work out for us. We still want Russell Wilson. I still believe in Justin Fields and think Justin Fields can be a really good quarterback in this league. If the Chicago Bears say, you know what? We'll give you three firsts or we'll give you two firsts and a second and Justin Fields. Some type, type of offer like that where I feel like I'm getting a young quarterback that can come in and be really good with the right coach right away, I might consider it at this point, especially coming off a year I only won six or seven games. At the same time, though, it would have to be a deal like that. You know, there's some people out there like, oh, I'll give you a first and a second. No, I'm not doing the Jared Goff trade to get rid of Russell Wilson. I'm not. This is Russell Wilson we're talking about here. He's still a top 10, top five on good days quarterback. So it would have to be the right price. Last year, I would have said, no, I'm not even touching it. I at least would consider those underground phone calls. You know, if a team wants to ask me about Wilson, I'll at least be like, I'm listening just because he is going to be going into his age 34 season and his style quarterback. I don't know if it necessarily ages well. Despite the struggles, it's going to be an intriguing matchup. It always is. Sunday, State Farm Stadium, Glendale, Arizona. We're going to be scoreboard watching the Rams and Niners. Lots to be kind of figured out here before the end of the 2021-2022 regular season. Corbin Smith locked on Seahawks. Bo Brock, Alex Clancy locked on Cardinals. Always fun to cross over with Corbin. Looking forward to next season's crossovers already. Uh Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for uh, checking out this crossover edition of Locked On Cardinals and Seahawks. And we will talk to you on tomorrow's episode of each respective podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. We'll talk to you on Friday.